Chedo Araka speaking, aka the Black Yorkshireman, and you are now tuned into the Council Estate Confidence Podcast. Today's guest is Jeffrey Boachi, and he's a broadcaster, an author, and an educator. Very sick guy, you will love this one. And whilst I've got your attention, I just want to let you know the pre orders are open for the Council Estate Confidence Bundle. So make sure you get that. I'll put that in the, in the description. Also, make sure you keep on listening to the Council Estate Confidence EP. And big up JWA on the cam. Legend. Lockdown. Room 73. Tell them, these, these. Same faces. Let's go. Listen. Thanks yeah. for coming. Thanks for making the trip. I know you're, <laughs> I, I know you're a busy guy. I know you've just released the book. I know you're just doing all sorts of stuff all around the country. So honestly, thank you for coming to uh, no, not at all, not Room at all. 73. We appreciate it. This is where the magic happens. All the tunes that you might have on your playlist from me. It's probably right. made in here. So yeah, man, the Council State uh, Confidence podcast. Like, I just wanted to interview people that I find inspiring and interesting coming from council estates, basically. Yeah, yeah. So tell me... Tell me, Jeff, like where it all started, where yeah. you're from, yeah, what let's estate go back do you to the come beginning. from? Yeah. Let's go back to the beginning. Like where, like where are you? Where is Jeffrey from? Yeah, like, it's a good one because I never talk about it. It's one of yeah. the things that people don't ask me about. That's this is what I mean. Like, I, you know, I know the type of questions that you're probably used to yes. answering, and I'm trying to make it different. Yeah, yeah, it's it's already different. <laughs> it's already different because no one sort of cares. Yeah, you start, basically, like, yeah, moving in certain circles. <laughs> No one's worried about where you grew up or what it was like, even yeah. though it's very different to a lot of the people that you end up like talking to, mm. you know, in like publishing for crying out loud. Yeah, it's such man. a middle class yeah. industry. Yeah. You know, so I grew up on an estate in Brixton in South London, mm. which is notorious, you know, because in the eighties it was rough. What um, estate was that? It was Matsfield Estate. Okay. It's still there, but the part that I grew up in, yeah. Matsfield North has been like redeveloped into basically like flats okay. for young professionals. So that bit of history is gone. Mm. Um, so the estate that I grew up in doesn't exist anymore. Mm. Um, and it's like down, um, you've got Brixton Hill, yeah. which is probably quite well known. Yeah, I'm aware six, of that. Seven, six, seven, six, yeah. seven, put it on the Brixton map. Hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. like the other end of Brixton. Um, Matsfield, which is down towards like Stockwell. I'm, a, I'm aware of Angel Town as well. Angel Town was yeah. the estate next door. That's like the that's like the big. Yeah, that's like where like PDC are from. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, yeah. I never went into Angel Town All growing right. up because it wasn't safe. Yeah, because it's another estate and it was right <laughs> next door. So there was obviously yeah, you just wouldn't be caught there, mm. which is mad when I think about it. Because yeah, it was like walking distance, and mm. there was no reason for me not to go there. But I didn't even have friends from from there. Okay, like, you know, that was a big estate, and Angel Town always felt rough mm. to me. But then. The way it was, you know, Brixton back then, there was something going on with Peckham. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's where Giggs is from. Yeah. I never went to Peckham. Okay. Because of that, of that reason. Yeah. Even yeah. now, as a fully grown man, big man, like, you know, big 40 <laughs> year old Jeffrey, I'm still a bit nervous about going to Peckham, even though <laughs> Peckham's like nice now. Yeah. But the estate was, um, you know what it's like in a estate? It's like yeah. your whole universe, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, you, you, you don't realise you're living in an estate per se, because it's just the edges of your whole world. Mm. You know, um, you leave the estate to go to school, or I did anyway, you come back in, and everything that happened on the estate was just like part of normal normal life. Mm. So I was lucky though, because I had a, I grew up in a house in the estate. Okay, yeah. But it was still in the estate. Mm. You know, it had all the walkways, it had all the areas that were a bit dodgy, mm. it had all the stuff going on. A lot of my mum's friends would tell her that they didn't want to come and visit and things because yeah. they knew it was rough or it had a reputation. <laughs> yeah. And my mum was like, well, it's where we live. So, yeah, yeah. You know, so Matsfield was always like that. But but for me, it was a good childhood, man. Yeah, you like know? siblings. Two older sisters. Oh, wow, man. You I, can know, tell. I, I know about that well. Oh, really? Yeah, same with me. Like, I grew up with my big sister and my big cousin. Okay. So, and just my mum, so I was always surrounded by women. Same with you, always same. surrounded by women. Exactly. Was, you, was, your, was your dad in your life? Yes and no. Yes and no. He was He was around. Mm. Um, in London as well? In London. Yeah. In, in the same house. Okay. But, <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a lot of West Africans will know what I'm talking about straight off the bat. Like, 
they can live in the same house, but it's not, they're not really together. <laughs> like my dad wasn't, as I grew up, yeah. he was distant. Okay. And it got to a point where he wasn't really, really part of the family, mm. even though he lived there. And then eventually, by the time I'd gone to uni, it was just like separate, mm. you know? Um, and then he was sort of doing his own thing, but still living in the same house. And then he left. Yeah. So there were a good few years when me and my dad were not close. Yeah. But as a kid, we were really close. Mm. He would take me places, mm. he would take me to the library, yeah, yeah, buy yeah. me bikes, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, and looking back, there was a lot going on that he needed to talk to people about. And I don't think he had anyone to talk to. Yeah. So, you know, now I can see it for what it is. Yeah. But, but yeah, but it was definitely a matriarchal household. Yeah. Women were running things. My yeah. mum was running the show. <laughs> and my sisters were her like deputies. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then there was me. And you was bottom of the full pile. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Which I quite liked, man, because it meant I had I had some freedom that my yeah. sisters didn't have. Yeah, same with me. Being the youngest, man. So, I could yeah. just, I could just like there was no pressure for me to like be if I was the firstborn son, I know that I would have been a lawyer or a doctor. Something like one of those like prestigious old fashioned mm. like get a good job sort of jobs. Yeah. But they just let me I just liked reading and yeah. comics and stuff and I was just out roaming. Yeah. But man. it was a good thing. I was just basically not the type to get into trouble. Yeah. But when I look back, I I kind of scraped through luckily because I was always out. Yeah, why do you that's what I mean. Why why do you think you didn't get into trouble or you didn't have it in you to get into trouble? It's like like did you, I'm sure you had friends that did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, those are my friends. <laughs> oh my God. Those are my friends were up to no good all the time. Mm. A lot of my friends, like from school age, would be like carrying weapons. Yeah. Standard. Mm. When I look back, I thought it was normal. It's yeah. bad. Yeah. This is like traumatic behavior. Yeah, man. Um, And I just didn't think anything of it. Mm. But I think part of it was that I, luckily, I never felt the need to fit in. Okay. And you and learned that from a young age then? I think I was. Yeah, I think because that, that's quite mad, really. Yeah, speaking to you, but as in like, because I did feel the pressure of right. wanting to fit in, right? And like, I feel like, so you, would you say you knew yourself from early, from young? Yeah, yeah. I had to. Mm. I had to because um, going up on a council estate, first of all, you need to know how to navigate yeah. like the area. Yeah. That's a skill. That's like something you need to learn quickly. Yeah. yeah. Because if you're just walking around doing anything, mm. then you're too visible. You might become a target, mm. a victim. Mm. And I learned that from really young. Mm. Don't be on your own in places. Don't act a certain way. Yeah. So I learned that. But at the same time, I knew instinctively from young that if I pretended to be like, one of these like like street like road and call yeah, you'll get g checked yeah fast. i knew that because <laughs> it wasn't me man it just wasn't me and i just knew from i knew that from really young that pretending to be that was never going to work out for me mm. and also like the kids in the estate were just kids yeah so even though other people thought the estate was dangerous mm. i kind of had a pass yeah just by living there yeah i could walk through the estate and there'll be the you know the groups of lads, yeah. the groups of lads that you're supposed to avoid, mm. and they would never start with me. Yeah, I remember mean, one yeah. time I had a friend um, visit me, and he he also lived in Brixton, but then he moved out to Milton Keynes mm. uh, from an Irish family, mm. um, and then he came to visit me and stay over. And I remember we went to play basketball on the estate. And I took my eye off him for like two minutes. Okay. And yeah. I looked back and he was like circle of boys around him, like trying to take his chain or something. Yeah. And I just walked up to him and I was just like, uh, and they saw me, they just let it go. Yeah. They just like melted away. And I realized at that point that I had some kind of diplomatic immunity <laughs> <laughs> just, just from having like grown up there. Yeah. Like they thought, ah, uh, cause it was home. So. Yeah. So, so talking weird. about your estate, was there definitely that, because obviously I'm from North Hull Estate. Yeah. Like, so I can't really obviously envision, I've spent a lot of time in London. I went a lot of times when I was younger. I've mm. got family there. But like, what was, what what would you say was special about your estate? Was there, was there, was, was there a, a big community feeling? Like, did you know the guy who owned the corner shop? Right, right. Like, was like, did you, did everyone, even though it might've been rough to everyone else, yeah. but in your own little world, was there, was there a big community feeling? Yeah, I think the kids, we all played together. 
So mm. sun's out, summertime. You know those long summers? Yeah. Like school, school summer seat. Uh, yeah. I don't know how yeah. long. that. There were definitely more than six weeks. Yeah, I def- swear. Yeah, at least 12. Yeah. And you just be out all the time. And you just play with everyone. Riding bikes. Like playing run outs. Like mm. just. And you, you wouldn't even like know everyone that well. Mm. But you would just all be out at the same time. Mm. So that was like a community in itself. And then you would get to the point where mums would know mums. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you might pop into people's flats. Yeah. And you got close enough to people to yeah. know that, you know, to sort of know them like that. Because I feel like a good community sort of polices itself. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, we had that. Yeah. Because there was no silliness that mm. went on within- Within the, the community, yeah. Yeah, yeah there it was, was always out. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And, and we all knew as well that there were like outside forces. Like Brixton had a serious problem with the police. Yeah. That's, you know, there were uprisings in the 80s. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. When I was really little- you know, I was born into a Brixton that had had yeah. So was you riots. was you was you alive with the, when the riots happened? The first ones, no, like eighty one. Yeah, I'm I'm born eighty two, but then mm. there was others in like eighty five, I think. And then in the early nineties, there was some other thing that went on. And Explain I remember, to me how what it must have been a very tense time in Brixton. Yeah, it always was because Brixton's got like a lot of black people in it. Yeah, a yeah. lot of West Indians, yeah, right? Yeah, but yeah. you get a lot of like um, Nigerian, mm. Ghanaian. Mm. Mainly that was it, Ghanaian, Nigerian, mm. and then like various West Indian. And so they were like the main like group yeah. in Brixton. Yeah. So it felt like a place for black people, right? Yeah. But the police had this historic tension yeah. with Brixton. So even though I kind of felt like this is just normal, this is just calm, I knew that people were getting stopped and searched. Yeah. You know, um, there was this like historic problem. Mm. And I remember the one, I think it was 94 when there was something that happened in Brixton, the police, something blew up. And I remember being like, being like ushered into the nearest, I think it was um, a KFC or a pizza hut. Mm. Like the police told us to like wait in there and we yeah. were looking through the windows and people were smashing stuff up. So it always felt like it had that kind of energy. Mm. It's a place of protest, Brixton. It's yeah, yeah. protest. Yeah, man. And like- the estates were like, you know, home. Yeah. You know, we weren't out protesting in the estate. It's just yeah. where we settled. Yeah. You know, so that that's like a big a big part of it, which I didn't clock at the time until I left Brixton yeah. and left London. I really realised, whoa, I like grew up in a real hub. Yeah. A real hub for like... Do you think it, like, all that sort of protest spirit and standing up for what you believe in, do you think that's that rubbed, rubbed off on you? Yeah, I feel like... <laughs> It gave me some confidence, mm. definitely, because I felt like because I could navigate my area, I could go anywhere as I got older. Mm. And But I also knew that there were other estates and other parts of London that I didn't have the diplomatic community, so I wasn't silly. Yeah. There were like codes and I yeah. sort of understood them. Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't go to like, you know, I wouldn't go west and then just like walk around White City. Like, yeah. Are you mad? Like... I knew my place. I, w- I would never just walk around Hackney or Tottenham. Yeah. Like, I wasn't stupid. And I remember it was only until I got into my 20s that I even started to venture into these places. Yeah. It sounds mad, but... Yeah. Well, I, I've spoke to a lot of London boys and they're, they're all the same. Yeah. Like their own area was their own area. Yeah. Like, obviously, you do- it's not like that in Hull. Right, right, right. Like I could... The only, I suppose, area that I ever had beef with was East Hull. Okay. So could you not go there? I could go... Well, yeah, we could go like... We, we used to go there, but we used to go there to find trouble because we had, we had beef with them. So we would purposely go there. <laughs> but we but, uh, but then I suppose tactically, because you're not yeah. going there one up or two up. Yeah, yeah, you're not you're going, going there with, 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 a, with, a, with a bit of a gang and yeah. stuff. Like, but yeah, like I wouldn't be there on my own, mm. but we would go there actively. And we'd go in cars, we're not on foot. Right, right okay, yeah. <laughs> so you can escape. So we could, <laughs> we could do what we're doing and jump back in the car. But that's the only real area. But I know in London, like yeah. you say, like, you're not gonna get a South London boy just roaming around. No, not no, in no, Hill, no. Like, no, like no, no it's, way, no it's way. Off, off that area, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You had to have friends that would sort of give you that pass. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't until I was in my twenties, I swear. Like then, I started to explore London yeah. properly with my friends from school, college, and stuff like that. Um, and then I got a bit more comfortable. But I feel like one of the things that's one of the things that's like really mad is that I I got used to operating like sort of outside of those codes Mm. and when I look back on it it was definitely a strategy Mm. so I I remember even little things like when 
I borrowed, I inherited my big sister's Air Max 93s, the orange and grey ones. Okay. Are they 93? I can't remember now. Was it 93s or 5s though? 95s maybe. Might, maybe probably 95s. Okay. 95s. The orange and grey ones. Is the it, Air Maxes. Yeah, I think it'll be 95s because yeah. that's like, uh, that's like a statement trait, yeah. especially in London. Yeah. 95s are the one sending it these. I always get the numbers mixed up, man. Always. And like, yeah. I remember she got them and she was like flexing, whatever. And then when she didn't want to wear them, well, she gave them to me. Yeah. I cleaned them up. And this is, so I was young because now my sister's like tiny compared to me. So yeah. this is when my feet were really small. I remember wearing them out and getting these looks. Yeah. And I thought, bruh, if I wear these trainers, it's like I'm saying to the world that I'm in a certain, yeah, like, I'm in a certain world. World, yeah. 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 And then I decided to just like not wear like mm. Nike trainers and not oh, really? wear not yeah. wear what everyone was wearing. Yeah. Yeah. And I just got that was a conscious decision. Definitely, definitely. And again, that goes back to the knowing yourself. Yeah, because I, I I got into like what you call like alternative stuff. Yeah. So I always loved basically I always loved black music. Yeah. Hip hop. Raga, mm. like New Jack Swing, whatever they called it back in the day, mm. all of that, right? Mm. But I also had this other stuff that I got into, like you know, a bit of metal, a okay. bit of indie. All right. Um, I had friends that liked, like even bands like Terrorvision, shit like that. You know, I ain't gonna lie, I don't know who they are. There but... you go, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's like just a little. I think, I think he's from Sheffield. Is like, All right. Know. So. And I was into like alternative culture, like skate culture. Okay, yeah. I was into skating. Yeah. And I was into comics. I was a nerd. Yeah. Um, and I always liked that because that's like another world. Mm. And what would happen was as I got older into my teens, I remember people would like try me, but it's like you're not in the same universe. Yeah. So I couldn't be touched by it. Yeah. And that gave me like another kind of confidence. So I was wearing like, Thank God there are no camera phones. I was a mess how I dressed back in the day. Like, I was I would go to like charity shops and get like Hawaiian shirts okay. and like I would wear my rucksack with two straps. All right, he's which one people of those. weren't doing back he's like one of those guys. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know what he's saying. Shelly's <laughs> looking at me like, oh now I get you. <laughs> and like and I would wear like, you know, like like plimsoles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. skate shoes. Yeah, yeah. Before everyone else had vans, I'll be like wearing like a pair of vans, plimsolls, yeah. that, you know, get from a skate shop. Mm. So that was alternative. Mm. And I'd go out to the West End. Like You weren't getting in the, into the clubs in the West End. In them. I'm not going clubbing oh, in that, in that oh, outfit. Yeah, I was no, going to no. say. I was See, gonna... that's what I mean. I was in another, yeah, I'll go different... to the other West End. I okay. was in like alternate All right. like spaces. I'll, I'll, I'll go to weird shops that sold like, you know, weird shirts and like weird record shops and stuff like that. Me mm. and my friends were all nerds, mm. you know? And like, we would, we would then, we would be in the West End mm. straight out of school on a Friday. All my other friends would go back to the estates, wherever they were from. Mm. And they're like, right, oh, you went West End. And we're like, yeah, but we were hanging out with like hipsters basically yeah. before they were hipsters. Yeah. That's yeah. what we, that was my thing. Okay. And so it gave me this weird confidence because I realized that I could just be a bit different. Yeah, man. And then people on the street, mm. they wouldn't see me as being like, they wouldn't ask me where are you from and all yeah. that stuff. Because I'm just not wearing the clothes. I'm yeah. like, I'm like an alien or something. Yeah. yeah. So I was doing my own thing, man. Council estate confidence, bro. Yeah, yeah. But then I still lived on a council, council estate. Council estate, yeah. And I still understood that world. Yeah. And I was still into that culture, you know, all those cultures. So I can't unpack it. It's like. No, nah, I love it though, man. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So. Going back a bit. Yeah, go on. What was school like for you? Oh, so, school. Uh, what was the schools like that you went to? Yeah, yeah. Primary school was cool. It was like, I went to primary school in Brixton Hill. Mm. Before, because now Brixton's so gentrified. Yeah. Like, it's mad what's happened to Brixton. Yeah, yeah. I need to write about it, because like, I can't afford to live in Brixton now. Mm. By a long way as well. If I tried to buy a house in Brixton, game over. It's not going to happen. Which is mad to me, because it's Brixton, mm. you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's, and I, I, I went to a primary school that had like, you must have had a similar thing that all the like immigrant, all the poor kids, mm. all the like, all the working class families, mm. they all sent their kids to the same schools. So I went to school with like loads of black kids, mm. loads of like Irish kids, mm. loads of like traveler communities. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, South American kids, Portuguese, mm. you know, people that, that didn't have a lot of money. Mm. That was everyone I went to school with. There were no, I don't think there were any like, 
rich kids in my primary school okay, at all. Okay. Like none. All right. Some of them had houses. Yeah, yeah. You know. Is that what is that what determined as being rich? They've got, <laughs> yeah. a, they've got a house. Yeah, yeah, we've got a house <laughs> with like more than one toilet. So school was always like to me, that was normal. Yeah. That was normal for me. What was secondary like then? Secondary school was like I went to second school in Battersea. Okay. Which yeah. is um Junction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, Come you know on, your way around. I know London well, yeah. That's yeah, like yeah. so solid crew, isn't it? That's like, it, that's yeah. it. Surrey Lane, man. Yeah, yeah. Um and my secondary school was like Catholic secondary school. Yeah, I had went to like, a Catholic secondary yeah, school. Yeah, well. you know, my mum and dad were like, go to Catholic school, it's strict, all that. Um, but it was in the middle of an estate. Mm. So to get through to the school, you had to pass an estate. So the number of my friends I saw get like jacked, like wow. they got mugged. I, I, I had friends in year like in year seven get yeah. mugged for their trainers. Mm. And then you'd have to just like run away so it wasn't you next time. What I think is mad about London though, when I like speak to some of like my cousins or speak to people that go to London, like you'll go to schools in areas that are miles away. I'm telling you, like, I didn't clock how weird that was until it's, recently. It's, it's mad. Obviously, maybe because I'm from Hull and it's so small. Nah, but it's like here, you go to your local school, end yeah, of. Yeah. In London, I had to, I was an hour plus journey wow. to get to secondary school. So age 11, my mum took me one time because she had to work. She took me one time, memorized the route, I'm on my own. Yeah. It was like two buses and then a walk or bus, train, bus. You know, I had to cut across London. And then you really learn how to... That's like you're dicing with death, innit, basically? Yeah, yeah, you are, because <laughs> anything could happen. <laughs> you know, and you have to go through Junction and then there's like some other rough school and they see your uniform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> there was some school, Battersea Tech, and it was like, they were always on our case because we were like, we had this like maroon blazer and some crazy tie. <laughs> we looked crazy and they were just like normal school. And they were like shouting at us and then, and we had our rough kids as well, mm. you know? So secondary school was mad because it was just like a lot of, it was a lot of black boys, yeah. like a lot. Yeah. And I thought that was normal until I left secondary mm. school and I realised that, oh wow, now it's not. Well, I, I went to college in Wimbledon. Okay. And I was like the only black kid in my whole year. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this is different. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> and again, my ignorance, I always think like, Everywhere in London's multicultural. No, no, no. But that's that's not the, the myth. Case, is that's it? the big myth of London. That is the big myth. Yeah. yeah, London lies to people. People <laughs> think they live in London, so they're like diverse and multicultural. Yeah. Nah, it's BS. Yeah. They're in different universes and they mm. don't overlap. They mm. do not overlap. And I learned that, you know. But school was always like, again. Like how did you How did you get on at school? Like, what What was young Jeffrey like at school? <laughs> um, <laughs> I always liked school, which meant that I always did well at school. Yeah. Um, I always worked hard. And I kind of, I'm like academic, mm. so school worked out for me. Um, I was like always like chosen to be a prefect and that kind of thing. I was head boy. Can you imagine Oh, that? really? Yeah, I've got that kind of energy. I'd love to see that photo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the weird thing is, is that I kind of got on with everyone. Yeah. I don't know. And I, I looking back now, because I loved school. Yeah. But because school was just like a youth club to me. Right, 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 it right. It was where me and my mates just could yeah. do what we want. Yeah, yeah. But if I could go back now, I think I would choose to be an in-betweener. Oh, go on. What do you mean? As in like, you're good in all friendship groups. Like the, yes. geek, the geeks like me, the yeah. chavs like me. Yeah, yeah. Was that like, you when you were at school? No, that wasn't me. Oh, okay. Like, I, I was a popular guy. Right, 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 and to right. some people, they would probably think I was a bit of an asshole. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but I was, yeah, probably one of the populist kids in my year group. Okay. Like, it, it was, life was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, I would love to be like in the middle. Yeah. So I could I could go speak to the geeks. Yeah, yeah. That I was could, me. I could go speak to the popular kids. Yeah. That was hundred percent me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like everything, the girls, everything yeah, yeah. like Yeah. That, that was, was if I could go back, that's what I would be if I could go back to school now. Yeah. Just okay. in so that yeah. was you. Yeah, hundred percent. I was like, I never played football. Mm. So in theory, that should have meant that I was an outcast because I just yeah. didn't play. I was like, I don't yeah, want to. Yeah, footballers play football. always the guys, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I would hang out with the footballers. And then as we got older, I was also like I sort of did my own things. Mm. I was head boy, but I just broke loads of rules mm. because if I didn't like them, so I stopped doing games. Like every week we had to do games, like get on a coach and go somewhere. Mm. And I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. So I said, I'm just going to hang out and play cards in the art room. And then no one stopped me as the way. So me and my mates were just, <laughs> like, we just didn't do games for like a, a year. Mm. Just hung out, just mm. like got food, hung out, whatever. And other people would want to do that with us as well. So some of the like cool kids wanted to hang out yeah. and we were playing like 
Marvel superhero top trumps <coughs> or like playing blackjack or whatever. Mm. So I don't know. And then hanging out in the West End and stuff, it gave us a bit of notoriety. Yeah. We started going to parties. Okay. Like in other parts of London. And then everyone would ask us about these parties. Like, where did you, did you go West and go to some party? I was like, yeah, I went to some house party. You know, meanwhile, because I did well at school, my parents didn't care what I was up to as long as I didn't get in trouble. Yeah. So I was just out and about. I yeah. looked back and I was, it was risky. Mm. A few times it went wrong. Yeah. Was, you, was, your mom, was your mum and dad, did they, like obviously stereotypical West mm. Africans. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Was it hit your books? Like, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like education's yeah, everything. That was it. Yeah. Study your books. As long as I'm doing that, I'm yeah. good. That's yeah. all they wanted from me. Okay. That's all they wanted from me. So apart from that, they didn't know. And I would be rolling in, like Friday night, I would get in, in, in my school uniform, mm. I remember like after Friends had finished and Friends was on nine o'clock at Channel 4. Yeah, Channel 4. And I remember I'd come I think in. Fraser used to come on after, didn't Yeah, it? and I remember I'd come <laughs> in to watch like Fraser or something after Friends. And I'd been out from like 3.30 at yeah. school. And no one ever questioned it. Like, But it's because my mum was working a lot. She was always out. She was mm. always working. She had mm. like a couple of jobs, whatever. Mm. And my dad would have been out working. So my sisters were just doing their own thing. So I had a lot of freedom, which looking back is a, it's a great thing. It is like, a great thing. Because like, I was the same. I had a lot of freedom as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. I'm just lucky that it didn't go left at any yeah. point because it could have gone it badly wrong. But yeah, I think like, a lot, yeah, I, f I feel like I was always encouraged to be quite confident. Mm. But there's a... But is that, is that, I think that's a, do you think that's an African thing though. Because yeah. I feel like West Africans, well, I can speak for. Well, you're actually, Nigerian, isn't it? Yeah. And okay, you, so you. <laughs> you know our confidence. Yeah, is, yeah. Is great. Nigerians like, a different <laughs> thing. Like, I'm going there. We just smile a lot. We're like nice people. You lot, you lot are hustlers, man. That's like, what I mean. So, but was that natural confidence? Was it instilled in you? Because I feel like certain households, like, sometimes it gets beat out, not beat yeah, out yeah. physically, yeah, yeah. but it gets confidence. Like, I, I had to learn to be more confident because I had a stutter. Okay. That's a big part of my narrative. All right. Like I had a really bad stutter from like childhood. Mm. I still do. It's the maddest thing because now I do radio, I teach for 15 years, I talk to people, I do talks, keynote speeches, but I have a stutter. Wow. And I remember primary school, it didn't matter too much because, you know, I wasn't doing anything that I needed. And you're just more free. Mm. But as you get more self-conscious, you get older, mm. it really hit home. Mm. And I remember secondary school, there'll be some days where I'll just pretend to be ill because I knew I'd have to like read out loud or something. Okay. So I'd just stay at home. Yeah. That's how bad it was. And I just, I remember being about maybe 13, 14 and just thinking, is this really how life's going to turn out for me? Like I can't just do stuff because I've got a stutter mm. and I'm scared of like talking and embarrassing myself. And I thought... I can't go out like that, you know? Yeah. So I have to work out strategies okay. for how to cope with having a stutter. But the thing is that you can't, it's not like a physical thing, right? It's not like you just practice speaking. Mm. It's like a mental and like an emotional thing. Mm. So I had, to, I had to work out that I had to just be quite passionate. Yeah. Because when you're passionate, you're not thinking about yeah, yeah. how you're saying it. Mm. It's just coming out. I had to learn how to, because when you have a stutter, there's a space between the words in your head and how they come out in your mouth. And I was aware of that space because some people could just talk fluently. I'm like, yeah. how do you do that? Yeah. So it made me really, it helped me become a writer because I was thinking a lot about words all the time. Mm. How am I going to say stuff? So I think that helped me. And then it just made me want to connect with people. So I always like was interested in people mm. and that was a way of weirdly getting through having a stutter. Mm. So that was like, that forced me to be confident. No, that's sick, man. In a weird sort of way. And that was good. That was like going to be my next, that's a segue into my next question. Like when, because for the people that don't know, like Jeffrey's like a successful journalist, hey. author. <laughs> like yeah. you said, he was a teacher. Like yeah. what made you get into literature? Yeah, uh, I think I was lucky enough to just to be surrounded by books. Okay. I remember my dad would just like take me to, I don't know, like secondhand bookshops and things. I think his his mate must have owned like a secondhand shop or something. There were loads of like comics and stuff. And I was just Was your dad an academic as well then? I think so, but that's not what he did. Yeah. He works in a factory. Okay. Um, but I think he he liked his reading. But we yeah. didn't have a lot of books at home. I don't mm. know. But he took me to the library. Okay. I remember him taking me to the library and getting my library card. So that was a thing. And then because I was in my head a lot, because mm. of my stutter, I just liked words. So I'd write poems, I'd write stories. It was a way of like communicating with the world. Mm. So that's why books was always going to be part part of it. But I liked so many things, but 
being good at English mm. meant that school went well because mm. it's such a big subject. So yeah, you know. So that was yeah, that was always a big a big part of it. Is there any raps that you used to do? Or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, always. Every black guy's got a mixtape somewhere. <laughs> but the hell, you know. I'll put money on that. <laughs> no, I'm certain of it. Yeah, um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> no, nah, I don't want you to spit. A good, good, good. Don't yeah, worry, don't straight, worry. straight down the lens. No, <laughs> definitely. No, I don't want you to do that. Because yeah, uh, I hate it when people do it to me. Oh, you're a rapper. Spit some bars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like, nah, man. Like, pay me, <laughs> pay me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not like you gotta stay sharp. Yeah. You know? So I think. But yeah, writing. Yeah, it's always been big for me. So like one. One of the things I like to ask people, mm. and I've asked like some of the other guests, well, all the guests, role models. Okay. Who we who were your role models growing up? <sighs> That's a good question. It's a hard one. Like it's easier for me to have them now. I can list people now, but mm. growing up, you 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 don't always clock your role models when when you've been influenced by them. But I'll be honest. I'll be honest. A lot of them came from things like TV. Okay. Like media, it's N- mad. No, no one locally. Locally, nah. Because I always like, but I feel like you knew, like you say, you you said you knew yourself from quite a young yeah. age. Like for me, who was it for you? Just like the the just the the top boys of the area, right, like right, right. the naughty ones, the yeah. kids who were known as being like hard or yeah. The kids who were stealing stuff, yeah, just the, yeah. the scallywags, basically. Yeah. I was like, oh yeah, like that. Notorious. Cool. Yeah, I want to be. I want to be like that. Yeah. No, I was I was different. That I never. One of my biggest role models was my cousin. Okay, his name's Kwabena, and like every other like African family, he's not my real cousin. Okay, but he's yeah, my cousin. yeah, we yeah. yeah we have him. Yeah, yeah, and he was a few years older than me, and he was like really streetwise, mm. really like you know his his parents had a long leash on him, and he was out, and he knew it. He knew the streets, and I was just his little tag along. Okay, and. He lived in Brixton and then they moved out to like Norwood, whatever. But he would be roaming London with just me tagging along. Mm. So when I was like young, like, you know, eight, nine, ten, he was like my big brother. But I looked up to him so much and he would be like introducing me to music, fashions. I must have been so annoying because I was just this weird kid and he was out there trying to be cool. He was wearing like the cool stuff. Mm. He had the like, he had the big daddy cane haircut, you know, all that stuff, you know. He had lines in his hair, all that stuff you weren't allowed to have. And Quabana was cool, man. Quabana was like driving before he could drive. Yeah. And I feel like he was a huge influence on me because he showed me how, how to navigate. Yeah. You know. I'm glad you, I'm glad you used that word because I'm gonna. Yeah. He showed me that and he was always, he was always like cool as well. Yeah. Like he always looked good. Yeah. Like physically like good clothes. Yeah. Like he could did, did he have like a cool demeanor as well? Yeah. Did, he, he, he wasn't trying. He just naturally. Never tried. Yeah. Never got excited. Like yeah. the voice, you know, but he would enjoy mucking about playing. And I was like his little brother. And I feel like looking back, he, he protected me. Yeah. So I would go and hang out with him and he'll be hanging out with some proper bad kids because mm. he was cool. So he knew all these like, like gang affiliated kids mm. and then he would have me near him and he would always keep me protected but I know he knew some bad like you know bad stuff and I feel like that helped me so by the time I got to secondary school I had these like lessons that I'd learned from him mm. in how to navigate mm. so I could hang around with kids doing bad stuff you know like kids that had like pellet guns they were trying to turn into real guns and stuff yeah. like that like really really bad stuff yeah. man like and I could be in that but not be in it and not feel as though I was like sort of you know trying to avoid it as well like I could just be like close to people make friends yeah but just on like a level and I, f- I feel like Quabbin was a big part of that because I saw him doing that yeah so I've noticed it so far in sort of like this interview podcast whatever you want to call it like You've used the word navigation yeah. a few times, like, and I feel like the world you're in, mm. the sort of publisher world and yeah, this man. middle class world, like, yep. how have you found your again confidence to mm. to 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 rise in that world? The first thing is, weirdly, to know that I'm not part of that world. Okay, 
and to keep that in the front of my head. Mm. So I'm not like, I keep publishing at arm's length. Mm. Like I'm not getting in bed with the industry. Mm. It doesn't trust me yet. Mm -hmm. And I know that because I don't think, I don't think anyone's written as many books as me since 2016. Fact. Man, I've got to I give you a clap for that. I swear. <laughs> I, I, I swear. I swear. I've got I five out and I've got three coming out. I love that. That's eight books since 2016. That's crazy numbers. And they're good. And I've written them all myself because people get ghostwriters and stuff like that. Okay. Does that, I mean, I don't know. I'm sh Yeah. Does that happen in the in that world? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Like, David Williams doesn't write all of his books. Like, yeah. You know, I've been approached to do ghostwriting for people as well. Is it classed as a ghostwriter in the in your world if say I'm telling you stuff yeah. and you're writing it uh, does, so, does that even happen yeah it does so yeah. if so for, for example there's been a few projects I don't know if I can say them but like um, you don't have to say them I don't want you to get in trouble yeah <laughs> a, a few fairly well known MCs yeah over the years their people have approached me because I wrote a book about grime so yeah. boom they like oh this is going about grime so they approached me to write their biography or to mm. write their autobiography mm. and me and my agent sat down and we thought, what are they offering? It's never that great. Okay. It's, it's not life-changing sums of money. Okay. And we thought, nah, you know what? Do your thing. Get your name out there. Mm. So I've turned down quite a few ghostwriting gigs, actually, mm. which maybe I could have done them. Maybe I'd... I'd you never know. Mm. But, um, yeah. But that, but that happens. But I've gone out of my way to try to get my own stuff out there. Mm. And the industry, like, I say it hasn't taken me under its wing mm. because I'm not like a household name yet, but I'm yeah. writing all these books yeah. and the advances are going up, Yeah, but I've not made anything like a living off just writing books. Mm. Nowhere near. Mm. I can't live off it, which is mad because they take ages to write. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so with all that in mind, the way I navigate the industry is um, I've been influenced by music. Yeah, man. I was going to get to that, yeah. I've been influenced by music. I and grew up listening to hip-hop in the 90s. Is, so is, the, that, is that what influences all your books, music? Yeah, the yeah. approach. The approach, 100%. Yeah. Like, I was a teenager when DMX was putting out three albums in one year. Yeah, that was like a monumental time. That what is it? that? You know, like They all went platinum as well, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, so I'm watching that. And I'm seeing artists just like flooding the market. I'm seeing like, you know, mixtape, single album. Out. Mm. And I'm thinking that's the way I'm going to attack whatever I do creatively. So I've got like a full clip. That's a very violent metaphor. Mm. <laughs> I've, I've got a full fountain pen of like works. Mm. And I'm just like bang, bang, bang to the point where you can't deny it. And that's like my approach. It's because I came up in, in the 90s listening to hip hop. I've got a very rugged approach to yeah. the industry. I'm like, all right, I've got a manuscript. Boom. I make sure my manuscripts are good. You can't argue. It yeah. is good. Yeah. Like, don't mess about. And then I've got another one. I'm like, this is good as well. Boom, boom. And so people have to publish it. I feel like you've, you've got that mindset, you know, when like, especially happens with African parents, <laughs> like... You've got to be the best in it. Oh man, you, it's you, a you burden. Know, you know that. Yeah, you know yeah, that. Like yeah. you've got, you've got to be the. You've got to work ten times harder oh, than. Yeah, which your, isn't fair. Yeah, it's not fair. You know, I would love to just be like average. But would, you wouldn't be happy if you was average, though, would you? No, nah, no, nah, I you've, wouldn't be. Set, are you a bit of a perfectionist? In a way, yeah. When I when I've got a project, I want it done to a standard that I know that is done how I, how I want it. Yeah, you know. It's not fair because it's a bit of an insecurity in a mm, way. Mm. Like, why can't I just coast along and yeah? Why, why can't I be a, be a C plus? Well, this guy will tell you, like, to, to my lefties, like, when I record a song, mm. the amount of takes, Jeffrey. Seriously, oh my! God. You can hear it though. Oh I'm not surprised because you can hear it, to, recording. Every syllable is. I'll be real to the listeners. Recording is actually not enjoyable for me. Seriously, no. If I could skip. <laughs> <laughs> the writing yeah. then just skip the recording part and then skip to just being on stage performing okay okay I love that right right but the whole recording thing yeah like I actually I actually have like booth phobia sometimes seriously like I'm, sometimes I'm scared to go in the booth because I, I, it needs to sound like how it sounded like when I when I wrote it okay and if it doesn't I just get real disappointed that's pressure so, so much pressure, pressure mate so much pressure but then so how do you get around that <sighs> How do you Be do having people like these telling me, mate, it sounds fine. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. move on. 
yeah, go, yeah. go to the next verse, go to the chorus. Yeah, it yeah. sounds absolutely fine. Yeah, that's important, actually. Yeah, you, yeah, you definitely yeah. need... You that need, perfectionist yeah, thing will get you. Yeah. Like, if I recorded myself... Mm it'd be it. nothing had ever come out. Really? Because you just keep on going? Yeah, it'd be a nightmare, mate. And I never used to be like that, Jeffrey. So When what? I was younger, yeah. I could go in a session and record four or five songs in a session. Huh. That could never happen now. Really? No way. No. It'd be about an hour or two on one song. Wow. Yeah, man. Like, what I if you get, had to? If I had to, I would. Yeah, like pressure's on. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd do it. But yeah. i get that deep into my... Because obviously, because I'm from up north, mm. people always say, oh, the accent, the accent... Whatever. Even though that's sort of changing now, yeah. but I just always want to be, I always want to get the bars out, need to have good yeah. clarity. Yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Which you do, like, when I listen to, you know, when I listen to Council State Confidence, yeah. you know, like, North Face, Dancing in the Moonlight, yeah. you know, these are songs that I've added to my playlist, so, I'm, so I'm, I'm hearing them a lot. Um, the delivery, mm. the voice is, you can hear you've, it's clear, mm. it's like deliberate. You know? yeah which I've always liked because, you know, a, a lot of people don't, a lot of, I'm starting to sound patronising now, but maybe younger music fans yeah. who, who maybe aren't used to like how music was. There was a point where mumble, like mumbling, mumble, yeah. slurring your words, yeah. it just wasn't the done thing. You had yeah. to have that pure, yeah. crystal clear, like clarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I feel like you definitely, to me, or an artist that upholds that legacy. No, thank the clarity you. Clarity is there. Thank you. So you hear it, you know. Nah, nah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. No, it's that. true. It's true. I mean that. I mean so, that. So your books. So I've got. I've yeah. did a bit of research. Oh, here man. we go. Did my Google's. Got the CV coming. Here we go. So like, <laughs> hold tight. Yeah, that was the first. That was one. the first one. Yeah. So like, what what was going on in your life then? Like, because yeah. he says he was. It was pressed in 2017, but then it got updated yeah. in 2018. Yeah, so I wrote another like 20,000 words. So you did you did what rappers do when they do that deluxe album Deluxe, thing. yeah, yeah, that's what it was. It was a deluxe <laughs> version, yeah. Just added a little bit and then put it yeah. out there again. Yeah, that was all about, that was all about grime. It was, yeah. it was mad because I'd been writing my whole life and I'd never thought to write a book. And then I saw grime was becoming like... The in thing. Yeah. That's like Skepta, like, yeah. shut down and that's yeah. not me that exactly time, on that it? Time. Jam and whip and all. Exactly. Stormzy yeah. was starting yeah, to come out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I realised, yeah, a German whip was mm. like a real turning point. Mm. And I realised that all these newspapers and stuff were talking about grime and they didn't know what the fuck they were talking about. Oh, can I swear? Yeah, of course <laughs> you can. Yeah. They didn't know what the hell they were talking about. Call, I, call, calling a wheel up a restart. Yeah, and all this <laughs> stuff. And I was like, this is mad. And I was reading about grime and like... Broadsheet newspapers. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking someone that was into like the music that led up to grime, like mm. UK Garage, Jungle, mm. you know, Ragga, Dancehall, needs to talk about grime. So I panicked and I thought, I've got to write about grime from the perspective of like black music in this country. Yeah. Just that, a side note, let me just stop you there. Yeah, go. What was it like growing up mm. in London? Yeah. In the UK Garage days? Absolutely insane. Like, like I'm so jealous. Oh man! Like because me and D's, like yeah. me and a lot of me and my mates, we we obviously we love UK garage. Yeah, it? same here. And obviously the 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 the, the sort of dress. Yeah, yeah, the machina all that and yeah. all that. Like going out in suits. Yeah, I know. That, to me, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, just, that's just <laughs> mad. That's mad to People me. But it just sounds shirt. like it was like a good laugh. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was crazy because the thing about UK, first of all, UK garage is to me it's, it's one of the best cultural artifacts come out of this country mm. like it's one of the best sounding musics mm. like you're gonna get um it was mad because garage was so uk yeah and in a way that before that a lot of the music you listened to wasn't uk it was mm. obviously american all the mm. hip-hop and stuff then you got a lot of stuff from like jamaica like dancehall mm. stuff but you this was like this sounded like uk mm. and garage was like it was so knew that it was still doing around like tapes getting passed around yeah. if you weren't old enough or had enough money to go out clubbing so i was i think i'm just on the cut i was just a bit too young to be out clubbing a okay. lot because it, it was expensive but the house party still must have been yeah yeah booming with the garage that's it yeah. that's it and people would just be like passing tapes around yeah and then what was great was that all the like expensive stuff yeah like would drip into your day-to-day -day. so i had like 
Machino glasses. Like, I mean, they were so expensive. I don't know how I convinced my mom to get me. They had like Machino in these little like beads on the side, like metal beads, and they would like rattle and it spelled out like, Machino. Yeah. And I went to school. I and you I felt saw, like, like there was a the guy. Didn't yeah, you? people were like, oh, <laughs> Jeffrey, look at he's got Machino. And people were like crazy mosh jeans and stuff like that. So all these like brands were yeah. like, you know, Versace. Yeah, man. So people were like, yeah. And that was all coming through UK Garage as well. Mm. There's, there's a bit of money involved in UK Garage. It was expensive. But then if you couldn't do that, which most of us couldn't, then there was the underground garage stuff, the pirate radio stuff. Okay. And that was just so exciting. Mm. I've got tapes of like Delight FM, So Solid Crew, mm. Pirate Radio, mm. and I would record it and this this stuff is gold. Like, yeah. you know, and you could only get it from a certain part of London because yeah. it was a pirate radio station. Yeah, yeah. The frequency wouldn't travel. So I was like, I would just listen to these tapes and I didn't clock at the time, but... That's like the birth of something. Mm. So exciting, man. So nah, yeah, man. Sorry to say, nah, try, nah, man, nah. I just love UK garage, and I'm, I'm just fascinated, you, fascinated garage. with that, with that culture. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Back to hold tight. So yeah, what? Yeah, you you were saying that you were seeing it in uh, in I papers, just, I, and, and, and I just didn't want journalists to be mangling the history of this thing called grime. Yeah, and treating it like a flash in the pan. Yeah, when it's part of a, a long history of music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can see how grime has got the long history going that way, and it's spiraled off into other stuff now mm. you know uk rap uk drill you know a lot even like the afro beat stuff funky house like all this stuff it's sort of grime was a big part of that so i had to, I had to write about the genre mm. that's why i wrote whole tight i just made a list of the songs that i loved mm. that i felt contributed to grime mm. and i just wrote a chapter for each of them and i knew when i was writing it i knew that it was going to be a book i was like this is going to be about seventy thousand words that's going to be about a book someone's going to publish it because it's going to be really good. Mm. And I knew that straight away. That's so. sick, man. It, it, obviously, it did well, didn't it? Like, for your first book. It, popular. Yeah. Yep. A lot of people, a lot of people really rate it. A lot of people mm. tell me it's their favourite book about mm. music, favourite non-fiction book they've ever read. Mm. Um, money, in terms of money, nope. No. I've made a grand total of like £1,700. From that book? Yep. Grand total, including the advance. Wow. That's it. I respect your honesty. <laughs> nah, I no, do, seriously. I do. People need to know. That's like, that's, you know, it was a tiny publisher. They were hoping it was going to make more of a splash. Yeah. But the industry didn't really like let us in too much. Mm. And the music industry didn't like know me. So yeah, they didn't yeah, trust yeah. me. So the radio stations weren't like trying to big me up. So it did what it did. It will sell on in the future, yeah. but it didn't make a lot of money. Okay. So when, when that happened... I was like, rah, so you can write a book, it can be really good, it can get published, and you can make no money off it. <laughs> I was like, I need to write another book then, because I'm because I'm definitely making some money off this. So yeah. that was part of the motivation to write Blacklisted. That's and that's what I'm going to. Blacklisted, yeah. Yeah. So I'm hearing about this book, Blacklisted. <laughs> and then someone's saying, Oh, so, I, can't, I don't even know who told you, but someone said, This Jeffrey guy, he's, he's wrote, he's wrote about flex. Yeah, in, oh yeah, in, yeah. In 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 this book and I'm like how did he even know about it like yeah of course so tell me man like not tell me not tell me just about writing yeah, about yeah. flex but tell me about the blacklisted book as well nice no, cause um as I say I've in terms of music yeah I keep my ears to the ground like I'm always listening out to what's going on in a genre mm. so listening to like grime and everything that came from it I was always fascinated by what's happening outside of London okay and I and I I'm quite good at spotting trends before they happen alright you know I remember like just even stupid things like yeah like Vans Plimsolls. Mm, you was on that before everyone. I'm telling you, I was <laughs> I had to really go out of my way to find them. I'm like people won't believe me, but little things like that, you know. I was I'm a, so I can spot trends and I realized there was something regional going on with grime that mm. was kind of important. Mm. I was hearing I was like, mm. so I was just interested in what who was making what mm. outside of London. Mm. Chedi Oraka. I was like, all right. How did you find it though? Was no it no idea? It must have been something on YouTube. It must have been. Oh, was it was it the Gram shutdown playlist or anything? Yes, maybe. No, 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 no. This was before I was on Spotify. Really. Okay. Like, I've only had a Spotify account for like, you know, fairly recently, really. Okay. Um, no, it wasn't on that. It was it must have been YouTube. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah, man. And then I just remember thinking, and obviously, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, she's from round here, she's from East Yorkshire. Yeah. So I was like, 
making a few trips up. Mm. <laughs> Hull's changing you know? us. <laughs> Trust me. Trust I remember coming me. here in 2007. Trust it me. Was, it was, it was kind of different. <laughs> I was going out to like sugar mills. Like, oh yeah. Like yeah. My, my then girlfriend would take me out like, let's go to this club. I was like, all right, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> I saw some of the craziest oh, sights at like two in the morning outside of sugar mill. Definitely. I was like, what is this place? You know, Piper. I was like, what? Yeah, you know, yeah, it was yeah. kicking off. Yeah. Um, but Hull's change. It's like, yeah. yeah. For the good. Um, yeah, 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 definitely. But I feel like then I was interested and I was mm. thinking, right, like people are making, people are making grime. And I was like, oh, who's, who's, who's that, who's that? Mm. And and you seem to be the guy straight yeah. straight off the bat. Yeah. For the region, like like no, within seconds, like, oh yeah, this seems to be the guy. Yeah. You know, that had the, the aura, you know. So I was interested in that. And then when you start listening to the music, I was like, yeah, yeah. And then Flex was a big tune. Yeah, man. You know, I was listening to it like, yeah. And I remember like Sophie, my wife, she 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 loved it. Yeah. Because she, of the accent. She never heard the accent. Yeah. So she was like, this is crazy, you know. And yeah. then we just so so this, so then it was something that was in my mind. So and this is why the I kind of like to let the universe do its thing, because now here we are talking. Yeah, man. And I swear like we were supposed to have this convo. I'm man. telling you, yeah. and I'm I know making the right connections is important because when it's right it all converges yeah. and it's something bigger happens than you yeah. can imagine. Yeah, man. Like I, I know that. Mm. And there's something which, which I'm sort of always thinking about, like who needs to meet who and how mm. do we connect? Mm. And it takes longer than you want sometimes, yeah. but you know. Nah, man. And then next was it, what is masculinity? Yeah, I wrote that with a friend of mine. We got approached by to write a book about masculinity for is kids. Is that Darren Chetty? Darren is Chetty, big yeah. like Darren Chetty. He's big into hip hop head, okay. which is like hip hop education. All right. I'm, I met him and he was just like on Twitter, just like atting people that were into education and into hip hop. Yep. So we met through that mm. and got into like serious deep talks about stuff. And we wrote a book about masculinity for kids. Like what does it mean to be a man? Mm. What are the problems with that? And it's, that's a, yeah, I'm really proud of that one because mm. we're talking about like, you know. What was it like to work with someone on that? Um, for him, probably quite frustrating because I work really fast. Okay, yeah. I'm terrible. People probably hate the way I work because I'm fast. When I've got an idea and I'm ready to like pull the trigger on it, I go and he's an academic. He's doing like a PhD. He works really slow. Okay, yeah. He's really thorough. Yeah. I just go like bam, bam, bam and just like it comes yeah, out yeah. and I research quickly. So, mm. but it worked because he's slow and I'm fast and then we talked a lot. So now nah, it was good. I'm really happy with that. And it was a good collaboration. Yeah. Nah, good yeah. man. And who published that or? That was um, uh, Wayland, which is part of Hachette. So you get these like big publishers. I don't know how it works in music, but you get like big publishers and then smaller yeah. imprints. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is a smaller imprint of a big publisher. Um, and it did all right. Yeah. And, you know, um, again, nothing life changing, but it's p people like it, people rate it. But, you know? So at this point, you're building your um, yeah yeah you're building like your portfolio. That's like, it. That's it. And do you feel at this time, at this point, sorry, that people are starting to respect you more as a author, or still the same, or yeah, a little bit. You your name starts ringing bells a little bit. Yeah, but at the same time, you're nowhere near like mm. known. Mm. You know, so every time you come up with a book, you're basically a new a new author. Mm. So I've learned now that no one knows my CV. Mm. You know, only now. A few people might, oh, he's written a couple of books before, but actually every book is like, I'm a new author coming mm. out. So that underdog energy, I'm like keeping it. Yeah. I'm keeping it close to the front because I'm not doing like Walliam's numbers. I'm I'm not making like a big splash, like David Olasoga, people like that. Mm. I'm, a lot of people don't know who I am or what I do. I'm mm. off the radar, you know, but that, that kind of keeps me quite hungry. Yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah. No, that's sick. Yeah. And then the next was Musical Truth. Musical Truth, yeah. Yeah, Musical Truth, which is for kids, but it's for everyone, really. Yeah. Just about black British history told through music. Okay. I love my music, obviously. I realised I was learning a lot about black British history. Never taught at school, nothing. School didn't teach me anything about, mm. you know, this country, really, in mm. terms of race. So I said, I'm going to write a book for the kids about this country's history race, racism, the empire told through songs. Okay. So 28 songs. And that was like, yeah. I that was sounds like, a, it sounds like you had a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. Cause, yeah. cause it can be, it, it could have been quite boring. It's a mm. history book, but mm. with the music angle, mm. it turns it into a playlist. 
So you just listen to the songs and I just write about each one. It's very conversational. And it's for, as I say, I wrote it for the kid and everyone. Like being a teacher, I'm always interested in like the young person in everyone. Cause I like, I, I, I like young people because young people don't have, often don't have the kind of baggage. Mm. So youthful energy is something that I like mm. being around. Mm. You know, rather than like adults that <laughs> think they know it all and they're kind of set in their ways. Yeah. So I write to that person. You know? What would you say your three most, your three favorite musical moments are in British Black history? Oh wow! UK, in UK though. Okay. Um, so solid crew. First of all, yeah. Twenty one seconds when that happened. That whole moment. Like, what the hell I think. Was... I think everyone was just, just upset. insane. Like that. What was it? Was it the Was it the Merbo? No, it was the Brits. Brit Award acceptance speech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they just that you just see Mega Man with the afro. Yeah, and, the hat and they were and all that. out there. Mega Man's like the coolest. Guy. I've never met him. Yeah, but I need to meet him because you know he just seems the coolest guy what in I the love world. About Mega Man as well. <laughs> what I love about So So is that you know that is a community like movement. Yeah. So it's a it's. And Mega Man's like community leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So deep. Yeah. It's like what the Black Panthers were trying to do. Yeah. Like Mega Man's properly thinking about how to uplift the community. Yeah. He didn't want them in prison. He didn't want them mm. dead. Mm. He wanted them coming out of that. Do you listen to some of his interviews now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. He's, he, like his knowledge. Yeah. Like yeah, he's, so, it's, it's really he's talking like what you're saying. Yeah. yeah like he, he do, he's like, oh, like a real gangster's not out in the street shooting his gun, a real gangster's like helping the community. Like... You, and he's and he did it for like the collective. It's, it's it's really powerful. I remember a story about him like saying when they got like big record deals and stuff, he was saying, look, let me like take this amount of the money, mm. invest it. I want to get a mansion. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. A, I've a said solid that. Yeah. mansion. And but we're gonna have this. The other members weren't on it though, was they? Nah. nah. But the vision's mad when you yeah. think about it. Like that's something like a hub for your families mm. and then to invest that into like the community that's that's deep I think he made everyone wanted a TT e yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of them got a TT yeah like, yeah they were giving each other TTs yeah. for like Christmas <laughs> crazy <laughs> it's crazy yeah definitely that that's a massive moment man like so sort of the crew I feel like um, other stuff like um, Moni Love um, she's got a song It's a Shame before that, she did a song with Queen Latifah. Mm. And what I love about that is that she was rapping at a time when not many British people were even rapping, mm. full stop. Mm. Like hip hop hadn't really made it. We had like, what's his name? Um, Slick Rick. Slick Rick, who was like legend. Mm. He sort of went to America. Yeah. Derek B was the closest, okay. but he was like doing the American accent mm. and pretending. My only love was like doing like, lyrically, it's really advanced. And she was holding her own with like Queen Latifah. And she was just some young girl from the ends. Yeah blew my mind Naina Cherry all that stuff like that whole moment like yeah. funky and Naina Cherry that's Mabel's mum in it yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Naina Cherry smashed it man yeah. like just all the influences mm. like throwing it into the pot crazy music you know John Barnes spitting bars oh, on free life <laughs> I don't know man <laughs> he's not a good rapper no he's not man he's John not, Barnes he's not a good rapper but, but that was a monumental moment just, a, was, just to have like one of the few, one yeah. of three black English footballers yeah. like rapping. Yeah. It just blew my mind in that World Cup. I was like, what am I seeing? <laughs> it's like John Barnes with his, <laughs> you know, that was, yeah. Moments like that. There's what, loads. What about Dizzy? Oh, Dizzy's just, that album, mm. Boy in the Corner. Mm. It's incredible. Just. It's like. Is it even an album? Man? I don't know. It defies all genres as well. It's like, people call it grime, but it's his, it's his own thing. Yeah. And it's like, and he was so young. You could hear- Crazy how young 14, he was. You could hear the 14 year old yeah. lyrics in there. So like, raw. So raw. And the production as well. Mm. Like, it was just him. He worked out a sound that he wanted to get out there. Mm. It was like nothing else anyone had ever heard. Yeah. And one listening to it now, like the energy of it. Unapologetic though, that's why I love. Unapologetic. Like, Stop that. Like yeah. what? You know, I love you. It's just like, audio yeah. tension headache yeah like, but it's, it's not stopping yeah I'd, yeah boy in the corner is just like yeah it's one of the greatest like artifacts to come out of uk yeah. music 100 percent. you know and then what are you what do you reckon are there any big moments so solid crew yeah 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 definite for me uh easy yeah who else is like 
on that level of having an impact? Uh, it's hard. There's so many moments, though. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, there's like, I don't know, like... If that's a good question. You um, me, even you even me, um, for me, a big one was when when Jungle really kicked off. Because mm. I was in Brixton yeah, in like 94 when Jungle was kicking off. And I don't think people get what Jungle was like. It was like, it was a whole new thing. Yeah. Was so it? when like... General Levy made yeah. it to the top of the pops. Yeah. Were incredible. Yeah, I bet that was crazy. Like, no word of a lie. Me and my sisters and my friends would be like waiting for radio stations to play it. Yeah. And I remember on a being on like buses in that summer, and the bus driver would have a little cassette tape yeah. blasting it out. Yeah. It was just like it was like nothing we'd ever experienced. Yeah. And it was so homegrown. It was like yeah. everything we loved, like Raga, we loved dancehall and then this jungle stuff that was new and exciting. Mm. And it was, it just felt like ours as well. Mm. Like no one else was doing jungle. So that was massive. And then it was on top of the pops. I was like, what is this? Mad. Top of the pops. Yeah. <laughs> like, General Levy. I think, yeah, definitely dizzy. Yeah. Definitely so solid. i tell you what was a big moment. That chip freestyle on Westwood. Yeah, with Ice Kid. Yeah. Yeah. When Wiley brought out Chip yeah, and Ice Kid. That was like mad. That was mad. Mad. For 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 me and my mates. That was mad. And you know what was a big moment for me personally? Cause I'm gonna say it like no one was listening to UK London rap before me in this city. Really? I don't think so, man. Like it wasn't it wasn't like Like I remember showing my friends because I what I'm gonna say at the moment is channel you. Okay, right, yeah. I channel remember U. Show, I remember showing my friends Channel U and they used to like laugh. Really? So they sit. just weren't feeling that up here? And not at first, like, okay. obviously in the end, yeah, yeah, but at yeah, first yeah. Like, they used to think the videos were, because the videos were tacky. Yeah, they were, they were tacky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It <laughs> but was I loved DIY. it, man. I just loved it. Okay, wow. And, and, and I, to be honest with you, a big moment for me that probably really wanted me to probably start spitting was the first time I saw the uh, More Fire Crew Oi video. Okay, that's I remember another being, one. I remember being in my auntie's flat in Stoke Newington. Yeah. Because we used to go there every year for carnival. Yeah. And I remember just thinking like, what is this? This is insane. <laughs> like you've got like Lethal in his Averex jacket. Yeah, yeah. Really in the super bikes yeah, and stuff. Like yeah. that, I was just, I was in from yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I was sold is, and, from there. Oh, and <laughs> instrumental on that yeah, is just timeless. Man. And like, timeless. just like the little, like, the little like speeches at the beginning as well, like yeah. like what oh, like they're like he's got bare machine, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah yeah exactly. <laughs> no, oh yeah, who do you think he is? All that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, that that I was just in from then in captivated with like London, like that was street yeah, culture. That man. was huge. That's another one that because I was a I was I was a uni when that made it to top of the pops. Oh really? Yeah, and I remember thinking, what? Because to me anyone making that kind of music were mm. just like kids from the mm. ends mm. and to see them on top of the pops mm. and it was so it wasn't like shiny or polished no. it wasn't it was really raw yeah and it sounded raw and i thought this is amazing so th this is a this is happening you know yeah, man. so yeah yeah that's a big one and it, and yeah it's it's got that energy mm. that you can't argue with it. Boy. So many moments. Skepta man. used that recently. Didn't yeah, he? yeah, yeah, yeah. Skepta used it, but you know. like Skepta is my, he's my goat. But we'll, we'll let's not even go because I'll be here all day speaking about that guy. So no, I'm, I'm a big fan of that guy, man. Like just what he's done for the culture, man. Yeah. Even like making being from Nigeria cool. Yeah, 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 exactly. Because because it wasn't. Yeah, well, <laughs> like, like, as you know, like, yeah. Jamaican, it was, it was cool to be a Jamaican, wasn't it? It's, it was, you know. <laughs> I know a lot of people that just pretended to have different names. They just <laughs> changed their names. A lot of juniors running around that aren't actually called junior, they just came up with a name because they don't want to use their, like, Nigerian name yeah. or whatever. So, yeah, no, nah, Skeptics, like, yeah, when I, when I really think about it, his journey as yeah, well. That's what I like a lot, the journey. Because he has not had it easy. Nah. And he came into the whole game like awkwardly. Mm. He was like actually slightly older as yeah. well. Yeah. And he was a DJ, he was man. A DJ. Yeah. And then he just had to like work out his lane. Mm. And then he's wrestled with his identity. Yeah. He's tried every lock to yeah. the industry. Yeah. He's done yeah. everything. Yeah. He's done pass out rip-offs. Yeah. He's done God. porn. 
video. Yeah, like yeah, the yeah. guys tried everything. <laughs> Motivational speech music, yeah, man. you know, funky house, yeah. pop songs. The guys done it all and none of it worked mm. until we just like, I love that because he had to really work out who he was. Mm. That's the real journey. Yeah, man. And when he worked out who he really was, game over. Game over. Game over. And, I, and, I, and I'm just proud of that. <laughs> like, Therefore. Yeah. That's something that I feel like I learn from. Like yeah. Working out who you really are. Mm-hmm. Once you really work out who you are, it's game over for yeah. the world. The world doesn't know what to do with you. That's fucks. They can't keep up. That's fucks. That is fucks. So the mission is work out who who are you? What do you believe in? Like, yeah. You know, and just do that. They will catch up. Fucks. Yeah. So let's yeah. bring it to present day. Present day, yeah. I heard what you said. I heard what you said. So I know, I like, I've been looking on your socials. Like, yeah. I know you've been doing loads of like promo for that. And yeah. Like, yeah. how's that going, man? Like, does that still seem new to you or? Yeah, well, I finished it a long time ago now. Yeah. Um, but that's it. Yeah, that that was a big book. That was about just me and teaching because mm. I was a teacher for 15 years. I only left in December 21. Mm. And it's all about that and being a black teacher mm. in a white system yeah, and man. what that's meant and what I've learned along the way yeah, um, and how I've connected with different people because yeah. when you teach you you connect with a lot of marginalised groups mm. you know like who's looking out for working class kids in this country for real mm. like who's really looking mm. out for them because mm. the system is not designed to, for working class kids to prosper yeah. it's to get them out the other end to do certain jobs yeah, and yeah. stay in their place yeah yeah so and I saw that up close. Who's looking out for all these different immigrants from all sorts of places, mm. you know, be it Eastern Europe or West Africa or whatever, you know, North Africa or whatever. So l- that was a story I really wanted to tell. And I felt like I had something to say. So this was a big book and it's been received really well. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. How was it received? Because obviously you're touching on some subjects that people people won't want you to touch yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. People don't want to talk about racism yeah. in, yeah. I mean, the current government, whoever's going to be the prime prime minister, Rishi Sunak wants me in prison, man. He's just come out and said that anyone that criticizes the UK <laughs> is like, should face, what is it? Like de-radicalization and stuff. Really? So my whole book, like, like technically, you know, that might criminalize me. You're gonna, it's going to be like that. Uh, there's all that footage of when obviously Tupac was they were doing all that gangster rap. Yeah. And like people was outside shop standing on the CDs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're gonna, yeah. They're gonna be It'll doing be like that, that to your book. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. I'm waiting for it. You know, <laughs> I'm waiting for it. Like I reckon that it's only a matter of time until they start like silencing if the government that we're gonna get yeah. comes into fruition. Which is why that I'm just gonna make more yeah, more noise, man. basically. Definitely. You know, it's that Brixton Absolutely. attitude, man. I think it is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> South London's like. It's got a reputation, mm, South London. Yeah, South has got the rep. Yeah, and I didn't yeah, ever think I was part of that. But I've, when I think about the way I operate, it's, there's a bit of South London in yeah. me, definitely. Like, I'm just like, no, nah, I'm doing my thing. So talk to me, Jeffrey, man. Like, black teacher Yeah. in Hull City. Yeah. Tell me what that was like. Like, just tell, like, how, how, how long was you teaching in, in Hull for? About three years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Was that your years. first teaching job as well? I was in uh, in in Hull, yes. I'd done yeah. some supply work. Okay. And I'd worked in Doncaster for a bit. Yeah, Donny's a funny place. Donny's a funny place, yeah. <laughs> um, and I'd worked with a, a, a lot of kids that had fallen through the cracks, man. Yeah. Not their fault. Yeah, man. Not their fault, not mm. their family's fault. Mm. Falling through the cracks. So and the system is just a mess. Horrible. System, yeah. Horrible. It really, um, that's like, to be honest, that's my long term end yeah. game is I want to get education fixed in this country. Yeah, That's I love the end that. game. I love that. We man. have to because too much potential gets wasted. Yes. Too many communities are getting overlooked. Facts. What I what I loved about teaching in Hull, you know, and I was at, you know, just like a normal school in Hull, mm. boys school, mm. um, was that a lot of the kids kids want people that are real in front of them, right? Yeah. So when they get a new teacher, they're just trying to work out who you are mm. very, very quickly. And what I liked is that they wanted to know me. And they were fascinated by where I came from, mm. but they were very open mm. as well. So I built really positive relationships with a lot of these lads. Because also the thing is, is that a lot of people outside of London forget that like outside of London just gets put to the back of the queue. Fuck. Like I live in Yorkshire now and Yorkshire gets overlooked mm. by the government. Yeah. 
in, in terms of investment even, mm. like even during like COVID and stuff, they weren't even like looking at numbers, like what was happening up here. And if you look at like somewhere like Hull, you know, working class communities mm. getting overlooked. So mm. I'm like with these kids mm. representing communities that have been overlooked for mm. generations. Mm. And I'm like, that's the level that I like to be at. Yeah. Cause I feel like that's who I want to connect with. Yeah. Um, which is one of the reasons that in terms of teaching, I never really left the classroom. I never got into like management and stuff. Yeah, you didn't want to be part of the SLT team. Nah, nah. It's not. It's not real enough. I want to be. You want to be on kids. the ground. Yeah, though, yeah, yeah. And what they're going through, and yeah. also what kids are experiencing, like, is always different to previous generations. Mm. Like, I don't know what it's like to grow up with like Instagram and social media. Yeah, like I've got no idea. But these kids are experiencing it and yeah. seeing the world as a young person now. So to me, it's fascinating. Yeah. And I want to learn about it, you know. So that was always, that's why that I don't think I can ever leave education. Yeah. I, I still work with schools now. Yeah. I always work with young people, yeah. always. Was it was it a bit of a bad and being a black teacher? Um, Not for the kids. Because no, yeah, I reckon the kids, it's, nev it's never it's, for the kids. It's never, yeah, it's never, it's never for it's the never. kids. And I'm not even saying that. Like, I can't think of a single like interaction with any of the kids that yeah. I've taught that was like negative yeah. at all. If anything, they were more positive because mm. one thing as well, which is clear is that a lot of kids that I've taught, like working class kids, they know just because I'm black that my route into where I've been, I've probably been in a similar situation to them mm. because there aren't that many like, they don't see like black like managers of businesses yep. or black like head teachers and things yep. like that. So they sort of knew roughly that maybe I grew up in a similar way, mm. just instinctively. Mm. So the real issue is like how I'd fit into yeah. education as a sector. Like yeah. structural racism yeah. is a thing. Definitely, know? I can imagine. You know, just, um, yeah, like just, I won't go into detail, but there's there are reasons why I've left the schools that I've left. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with the kids. Yeah, never. I don't feel it ever nothing has. Nothing to do with the kids. And this is why that. I like to put my energy towards the kids, man. Like, you know, like Wu-Tang said, Wu-Tang is for the babies. <laughs> yeah, man. It's true though. Nah, I you love know? that. And I feel like you could have, you could have uh, been disheartened. Mm. So some of your experiences, I'm sure could have disheartened you from yeah. carrying on with teaching. Yeah. But teaching's a privilege. That's the way I see it. It's a privilege to spend time with like young people and to like, grow with them mm. that's a privilege yeah so i would never like i would never say that being in the classroom was like i was disheartened like, like, i loved working with kids yeah like, i worked in like a pro oh what well, well, okay so you were working with so i worked like well on paper yeah some of the worst behaved kids in, yeah, in yeah. the city yeah but i loved it and yeah. they loved me this is maybe it. similar is like it. you say about they understand the struggle. And I, and I knew them, and like I knew the struggles they'd been through because I'm from similar. Yeah. Like there was all from council estates. I'm from a council estate. There you go. There Loved you go. it. It was my best ever job. It was like a sports pro. Uh, oh, wow. So they'd like achieve like a B-Tech first yeah. in like- That's in, amazing. In, 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 in sport. Yeah. But like what was amazing is like, they was delivering their own coaching sessions. Seriously. To each other as well. See? So you have like some of the most naughtiest kids yeah. in the city delivering- to some of the other, and there was yeah. all and there was all respectful, See? and we built that ethos. Like I would, I'll say, I built built that ethos yeah, yeah. at that school. At that oh, school, man. like it was it was brilliant, and like I'm still in contact with all the kids now. Man, this is it. And Ooh. then I and, and then I went from then I went from that to mainstream. Right. I went into the pastoral care mm. at Andrew Marvel School. Oh, okay. Which was good again. Mm, mm, mm. But you say it's it's never the it's different. It's never the kids that's a problem. It's never the kids. It's, it's never always the, the hierarchy in the system. Yeah. But yeah. I loved it. I loved it, man. And like I say, these kids now come to my gigs. See? Buy my t shirts. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like 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 I used to treat them like my little babies to be yeah, honest with yeah, you. Yeah. Especially my the last year group that I left. Mm -hmm. I got them in year seven. Okay, and so they were little, they were little were, babies, yeah. yeah, but like and I see them now that like obviously they've had their prom and stuff like that. Yeah. And they're just, it's, and they're I, I love it, man. I'm, I'm the same with you. I like being around yeah. youthful energy. Yeah, it's important. It's important. Like that's that's amazing to hear. All all power to you on that one. Yeah, man. I loved it, man. I lo especially from where I came from as well. With like I didn't really I want that academic. Obviously, I went yeah. to uni and stuff, but want that academic and yeah, man, definitely. Yeah. 
And this is where schools get it wrong because the the pathways that they offer out yeah. are so limited. Mm. And school itself is like, it doesn't work for everyone. Fucks. And then the pressures that they put on kids mm. for, it's not really for the kids' benefit either. Like getting GCSEs is yeah. usually for the school's benefit because yeah. that's the currency yeah. to prove yeah. you're a yeah. good school. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're just whipping kids through the system. Mm. It's not working. Kids I saw some crazy out. things, man. I bet. I did like, just obviously I'm not going to, say it on, on cam, but I, I saw some mad things. And like you say about kids just slipping through, man. Yeah, and then it goes wrong and then their whole future's hanging. And yeah. then all that potential, all those mm. skills. And also the one thing which is really scary is that a lot of schools now aren't prioritising the arts across yes. the whole the whole. Why board. though? Tell me as a, as a well, as an educator, yeah. why do they not prioritise? Because we, we know... Yeah. We're both music heads. Yep. Everyone in this room's a music yep. head. And we all know that the best music mm -hmm. comes from working class yeah, always. neighborhoods. Always. Like, why is that not at the forefront? They don't know what's valuable. They think what's valuable is what's like, you know, bringing in money. So, yeah. the, so the government is like worried about certain industries that can make money. Yeah. And also kind of this general thing of like, having a degree means a certain level of education that means you can get a certain job. Yeah. But what they forget is that, you know, the lifeblood of like us is the arts, like music, like performance, drama, like all of that stuff, mm. art, like paint, you know, whatever. And when you fail to invest in that, you're like cutting off so many avenues. Yeah. You know, and a lot of, a lot of people, not just kids at school, but a lot of people they're not cut out for these particular industries or an academic route, you know, there's other skills they have. Mm. And if you're, not, if you're not unearthing those skills at school, mm. then where are you doing it? Like we're talking about council state confidence. A lot of people I know that did terribly at school mm. have got like so many skills. Yeah. Cause skill you're, sets. You're le Cause you naturally learn it. This is what I'm yeah. trying to say with this whole council state confidence. Yeah. Like my mantra is that because I've grown up with a lot of kids who don't realise how talented they are. Right. They're just not talented in... In the way, yeah. In the academic yeah. way. But yeah. like, they're superb storytellers. Yeah, right. Naturally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? You can, I, 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 I like, naturally comedians. Yeah, oh, yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, like exactly. naturally, exactly. like, but they, they've never been honed in on that. Yeah, exactly. There's so much of that. Like just all sorts of skills, like organizing people. Mm, or, yeah, you know, yeah. just uh, there are some kids I grew up with. They were just like they were just like man managers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. can get like, why we're doing this? Did it? You did it? And it's like it's just a skill. Yeah, and yeah. it was never nurtured. Mm. So they either use their skill in the wrong context, yeah. or they never use that skill, mm. and then their potential gets like limited. How can we change it though, Jeff? One of the things you need to do is right. To me, it seems quite simple. At school, you've got what? Like how how many years from the age of four, whatever, mm. five till 16? Mm. That is time to work out what people's natural like abilities are and to make them realise what energises them and the skills they're going to lean on and develop to go forward in life. That's the whole point. And if you don't do that by the time they're 16 or 18 or whatever, then mm. we failed that person. Because mm. everyone's got more skills and potential than you can ever imagine. Everyone can change the world. Everyone is a superhero. Mm. It's just that you need to work out how, right? Yeah. And if you're not doing that at school, then what's the point in going to school? For academic people, they learn at school that they're academic because yeah. that's what you do at school. So you learn, you've got that skill. But a lot of my skills I'm relying on now, because I don't have a... I don't have a salary now. Like I'm a freelancer, entrepreneurial mm. type person. Mm. I'm in publishing sort of, I'm relying on certain skills that I've developed and I've had to work out what my skill set is. Mm. I weren't, I wasn't taught that at school. Mm. You know, I didn't realize that I'm a really good divergent thinker or that I'm like, or that I can see creative opportunities or that I can like find links and patterns and stuff like that. I didn't know that about myself. I've had to work it out. But imagine if there was a teacher that just like told me that. And everyone's got a few teachers that do bring out this, yes, yeah. you know, and those people are amazing. But if everyone had that, then you leave school as a young person and you know yourself, then your potential is unlocked. Yeah. And then you can just go and make it happen for yourself, you know? So that's where schools are going wrong. 
we're not unlocking the potential. We're trying to squeeze people through the same shape hole. If you know what I mean? Mm. It's sad, man. It is. It is. And then if it goes wrong for you, you got to start again later, and it's harder yeah. later. You know, we need to be encouraging people, and we have to assume that everyone has got lots of potential and lots of skills. It's so important. Yeah. No matter what they are in a pro, yeah. you can't just assume that kids are like not good. At, like everyone has got skills, potential, you know, creativity. You know, everyone has that. You just have to work out what it is and mm. keep on working it out. You know, that's the job of the adult. Yeah, and surely a good educator should be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because, definitely. like you say, it's not the kids' fault. It's not. It's never the kids' fault. It's never the kids' fault. And we all do different things. Well, you know, that's it. That's it. So that's what I'm pushing towards. So I want to like train teachers up to shape curriculum that does that, mm. that creates spaces for people to find out what they're good at. Do you think we're... At, I feel like there's just such a fear to change the curriculum though. Yeah, oh, man, massively, massively. Yeah, it's all fear-based. It's all insecurity and fear, you know, because the minute you change stuff, you can't guarantee certain things mm. and they want to guarantee everything. Mm. They want to guarantee that these qualifications mean that. Da, 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 da. Yeah. You get these jobs, da, 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 da. you know, then you've got a mortgage and you're set. You know? Yeah. And, and that's a pattern that society yeah. wants to, yeah. you know, but all the amazing people that, that we respect, people that we talked about yeah. today, they all broke that mold at mm. some point, you know, be it Dizzy Rascal or Mega Man or Nana mm. Cherry or, you know, Notting Hill Carnival, Claudia Jones, the yeah. person that made that happen. She she broke the mold. Like, mm. you know, all these people, they break the mold and they do something because that they the people don't expect them to do or don't yeah. believe they can do. Yeah. And I feel like that's that's the other thing as well that we need to encourage. And then we we like we rebelize them, don't we? Yeah. We call them rebels because they yeah, don't yeah. they don't want to fit in line. Yeah. But yeah. really are the rebels like are they, like yeah, they are rebels because they don't want to do the norm, but we should make sure that that is the norm. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's the norm to stand up for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Because when it goes well, everyone, when people make it, people love to pour in the, pl- the yeah. place afterwards. Give the flowers. You've got to do it before. Yeah. You, you, you've got to help people along along the way. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty deep, man. It is, man. It is, <laughs> it is pretty deep. So obviously I know you've done a lot in terms of like race relations. Yeah. You've spoke a lot about that stuff. I know you're passionate about that. One question I'm going to ask, and I think it's an important one. Do you think, and I know the answer, but a lot of people might not know the answer. That's why I'm asking it. Do you think the UK has, let me look at my phone. What did I actually, how did I wear it? All the suspense is killing me. It's not even that big, really. (laughs) Oh yeah. Do you think the UK has a problem with racism? Yeah. Definitely, definitely. It's got a problem with um, with not just like racism, but just like, it doesn't, it's got a problem with its own history of power. Mm. That's what the UK struggles with. And you can see it in like, you know, someone like Prince William. Okay. He's like my age, right? Yeah. The guy's my age. Mm. He goes off to Jamaica thinking it's all going to be gravy, Mm. not realising that there are people in Jamaica that have got a problem with the UK for Mm. historic reasons. Mm. And he sleepwalks into that. That's mad. He should know that there's a legacy, the empire, what it's done. Is that that his privilege that doesn't allow him to know? It's also he's been protected too much from it. He's never been taught it. Yeah. You know? So the UK has got a massive problem with that. And also the, the, the UK doesn't, it struggles to like work out how to how to include the have nots. Like that's what this country really struggles with. In America, it's a different thing. They've got their own issues, but they believe in like independence. They believe in if you make it or out of hard work, you can do anything. They mm. they believe that if you earn what you earn that you can be the same status as other people mm. and that you deserve that, mm. you know. This country's got a weird thing where, like, they believe in the hierarchy here. Like, mm. you're stuck in your class or you're stuck in your box. Mm. And you can see it in the UK. There's something gone wrong with the way Britain sees different groups of people. Okay. And it doesn't actually want people to sort of, like, leave their little, you know, strata. Yeah. And that means that 
the contributions of different people and different groups aren't respected enough in mm. the UK. Mm. So I don't think this country fully clocks how much it's got from its different, you know, ex-colonial um, groups and communities. Yeah. It doesn't clock how much working class communities have given to it mm. over the years. Mm. It doesn't respect it. And that's just a tragedy because a lot of these groups have given so much to the world, but this country's not bigging them up. Like, if this country realised for a second what it had, just look at, like, music. If it realised who had come through the ranks and what that was doing across the world, mm. like, the government would be employing employing Skepta to go and travel the world and be British because Skepta's part of a legacy of music that is making waves all over the world. But this government doesn't understand that or respect it. Mm. You know, same with working class communities. This government doesn't respect what working class communities have done for the country. Mm. So it doesn't put it up there. Mm. It sends Prince William out. <laughs> it's like, why are you sending him out? Yeah. You know? Send like... I think, you know? the, I think the country's got a pr problem with ag acknowledging. Yeah, I think so. And it's got its head in the sand about what actually happened as well. Like, yeah. we're not taught it anything about what really happened. Yeah, because that was going to be one of my questions, like... Why? Why does it start with slavery? Well, yeah, quite. You know, this is it because, like, even till now, yeah, in the curriculum, simple, it's like a simple story. It's a simple story that's easy to understand, and so it gets trotted out like a fairy tale. You know, slavery, da da da. It was abolished, da 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 da. End yeah, of. but that's like, it's not it. There's complex things. You know, there are people in this country now who have generational wealth, mm. right? Um, and that generational wealth was on the back of slavery. Mm. It's in their family. There are companies and businesses that sort of, like the reparations paid for, to slave owners when the slave trade was abolished. Mm. It was the equivalent of like, I want to get this right, because I think it's, it's a crazy figure. I swear it's like 2.2 .2 billion given to slave owners in this country. Yeah. That's a lot of money. The, yeah. the government will never give 2.2 .2 billion like, pounds to normal people just to keep them quiet. Yeah. So that money is like in certain people's families, but not everyone's families, mm. you know? So there's a lot of people out there that are very wealthy and part of their wealth is that, mm. you know? Meanwhile, the rest of us, we're just scraping through and making it work and struggling along on the edges as well. Like... And I feel like that's the other thing, like how we make it, and when I say we, I mean anyone that's not centered and privileged, yeah. how we make it, those stories are so important mm. because we've worked things out. We've had to succeed. We've had to be resilient. We've had to coordinate against the odds. And that's not celebrated. All those kids you talked about end up in a Peru. Mm. One thing that's never talked about that, like, they have made it that far. Mm often against the odds coming from crazy backgrounds. Trust like, me. Like if I had the same setup, yeah. would I even get out of bed in the morning? Would I yeah. even make it? Yeah. You know, this is what, so you, that you, needs to be you, celebrated. That is council state confidence. Yeah. 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 What yeah, you've yeah. just said then, yeah, like yeah. in, in, in them, in that little sort of statement there, mm. like some of these kids, it's like, it's a miracle that they even, it's a, it's that a they even miracle. get up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The trauma, like, the, the, the historic fucks. barriers. Are you yeah, mad? Like, man. And I feel like this government or the current government definitely, it doesn't respect that enough. It doesn't care mm. enough about that. It's not empathetic in enough mm. to even see it, let alone, let alone praise it. Yeah. Because it's praiseworthy. Yeah, man. You've got to praise that. That's why I'm doing this, man. Yeah. That, that's my why. Yeah, yeah. That's my why, man. Like, it's for the underdogs, do you know what I mean? Yeah. The kids who are still using a food bank, do you know what I mean? Like, you. yeah, I do. That's why I do this, do you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, and like you said, they should be celebrated. Yeah, it's like just to make it mm. so far is huge. Where Fucks. everything stacks against you. Fucks. So, you know, and if you've grown up with like generations of that, yeah, I feel like that in itself is something which needs to happen rather than seeing people as broken yeah see what they've achieved yeah they've yeah. made something happen yeah man you know so yeah that's another one that's another deep one <laughs> what a legend you are Jeff man I think I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna like 
come to rounding up, but I just want you to tell the people what's next. Yeah. Um, I think, as I said before, my end, my end game is quite long. I want to fix education in this country. Mm. I want to, I want to fix teacher training in this country. Mm, mm. I want teachers to talk like how we've been talking yeah. and have these kind of conversations, these kind of insights. And is that is that like what the business you and your... Yeah, my wife you and, and you, I, you, yeah. Is that um, what you... Because I know you're, a, you're an educator facilitator as yeah. well. You go into schools and... Yeah, we do yeah. that training, okay. consultancy, a lot of um, kind of um, anti-racism work, but mm. also beyond that, just looking at the curriculum looking at inclusion mm. holistically, mm. Um, which is really hard because the conversations are just starting. So yeah. It's, it's hard a, a, a lot of people that don't want to admit they've made mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. They don't, they're not willing to have the conversation. Yeah. Because this is quite hard. So I'm like years down the line in my own head yeah. in terms of how to change education, how to get people to think differently about what it is, how to think differently about how we train teachers, mm. how to fold in the arts, mm. you know? So that's my like, end game um, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna keep on writing because there's more to say more to do um, my next few projects are fiction which is kind of exciting kids fiction mm. um, but it's going back to council state confidence set in the 90s set on a council estate mm. hyper realistic you know kids growing up with their siblings yeah. trying to make it work without a lot of money mm. it's not autobiographical but it's definitely of the world that mm. I grew up in um, and I feel like those stories need to be told and I want to show through these books my my aim is I want to write like a series like Harry Potter mm. but not wizards just like normal kids yeah. from the estate because yeah. that's a magical world as, as well Yeah, it's a magical thing like you know and I want it to be realistic but fantastic at the same time yeah and i want to show people that those stories are as big and exciting and adventurous as your big exciting like fantasy stories so the next yeah i've written the first two in that series and i'm so happy with them Sick. So that's kofi and the rap battle summer is the first one which is coming out next year yeah and then there's a sequel to that um so yeah that's really exciting and then just more more education yeah, musical man. world yeah i've written that which is a full arts musical truth which is looking at power politics and popular music so i'm just hoping to try to you know educate through that as well through music and that you're a legend man oh, i'm done yeah i don't know you're a legend man yeah, trust me just, you're a legend you're doing a lot of yeah a lot of sick things man we appreciate you trust me no thank you thank you and f thank you for for this this is this has been brilliant yeah and as i said the connecting is so vital to me like i can you you know when you can sort of see like in your in your peripheral vision you can yeah. see the potential for something it's, yeah. like, it's starting to happen yeah that that's very exciting to me because i feel like we're gonna connect like there's gonna be connections happening yeah in surprising ways and mm. we're gonna be able to build stuff yeah that's outside of these industries. Yeah. You know? I don't need the publishing industry. Like I'm, I know sick people, like, you know. <laughs> I love it. No, thank you, honestly, Jeffrey, man. This has been the Council Estate Confidence <laughs> Podcast. Jeffrey Boachi. Yeah. So did I say it right? You said it right, man. Buzz in, man. Buzz in. Because <laughs> I hate when people get my name wrong. <laughs> nah, thank you, bro. Thank nah, you, thank bro. Thank you so much. It's been great.